March 16th of 8. And then it was uh, the Academy's creation was part of the Military Peace Establishment Act introduced by Massachusetts Congressman Joseph Barnum and signed into law by President Thomas Jefferson. Um, so with that, I will yield the floor to Tom for our official historical moment. Okay. All right. All right. Good. Okay. Okay, so this is our historical moment. We just started this last month and we set the uh, continued uh, prompting of uh, John Greer. And, and basically, if we do a historical moment like this, when we turn in a certain report at the end of the year about what the activity of the chapter has been, we get extra points for this. So John's all about getting the points. Anyway, so we did. And he actually, the next morning, or after the meeting we had here, by the next morning, he had the historical <laughs> moment for February already in my inbox. So that's how much he pleads and doing Okay, so um, this is sort of a really interesting one. And when I first got it from John, I said, are you crazy? But but anyway, here's it. Is it? So the question here is, and if anybody, uh, DL, you've heard this before. I can't answer. Okay, you can't answer. That's right. Okay. So how old do you think the oldest volunteer was that volunteered to fight in the Revolutionary War? Anybody got any crazy guesses? 60. 60? 60? 92. Oh. Well, 92. What did he say? 90, 92. 92. 92. 92. So some, somebody, somebody intercepted this email. Okay. So uh, he was uh, he was basically ninety one years old. Hmm. Al, was that you? Or who was that? It was Carrie. Oh, Carrie. Okay. How did you know that, Carrie? Uh, it's a lucky guess. <laughs> oh, come on. You did one year. Okay. So, so uh, anyway, uh, uh, Henry uh, Francisco was born in France, and he says. At least he had reported to say, and in, in uh, basically it was in his uh, pension application, that he was born in 1686. Oh. 1686. Uh, when he uh, enlisted as a private in Captain Burroughs' company, okay, uh, Colonel Warren's regiment of the Continental Army, on January the 15th, 70, 1777, the elderly soldier was 91 years old. When he was discharged on April 20th, 1778, oh, that's when he was discharged, and uh, he was serving basically for, came from Vermont. And basically, he survived another 42 years. Got everybody's attention now? <laughs> another 42 years, okay, dying on October 25th. 1820 in Whitehall, New York, at the age of anybody doing the math? 134 years old. Now, this is what I was thinking. That's Greer, Greer, John Greer is setting me up here. I was seeing this happening. You know. So anyway, it's he, he had he had said he had been present at the coronation of Queen Anne of England. He'd been married twice. And he was the father of 21 children. And this came out of our SAR magazine that we get periodically. That I hope everybody gets in the mail once you're in. Okay. And uh, from April of 1967 on page 11. So, so I thought, I better check this out just a little further. Because <laughs> John's been known to do things like this. Every once in a while, right, Tio? Yeah. Yeah. So I uh, went on to our, basically, our SCR Patriot uh, search. What? Patriot, Patriot, Patriot Records. Patriot Research System. Patriot Research System. CRS. Who Tio knows very well. And I looked up uh, Fra uh, Henry Francisco. And guess what? It's in here. Okay. And one, two, three different compatriots. Have used him to get into the SER. However, uh, let's see here. Where is that? Uh, 
Yeah, anyway, so but however, there's there's a little note that's attached before I tell you about that. Let me tell you, I went over to the DAR because the ladies always seem to be ahead of us on this. And so I looked him up in the DAR, their record. And there was 22 companions or waste, but what do they call themselves? Sisters? I don't even know what daughters. Daughters. There are 22 daughters that got into the DAR on this guy right here. So maybe there's a little truth to this. However, it says here uh, basically the comments in his pension application of 1818 stated his age at 130. And then this is number two. Proof of this, proof of his date of birth from sources other than the pension or uh, tradition must be provided. So they're not sure about when he was born, for sure. So that still may be uh, all there. But anyway, so that's that's our, our, our historical moment. So I hope y'all enjoyed that one. I'll have to send a message. When I don't, when I don't get... The next one by noon tomorrow, Mark. I'm going to see it. John Gurbet said, Well, where's the one from March? Your program. Yeah. Okay. 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 Let's see here. I'm, um, Steve, I'm going to open up your laptop and plug this in. Sure. So we hopefully I'll start talking. It should, it should have worked by plugging it in, right? Yeah, it should. I don't break it. May have played with the buttons here. I'll let her do she here first. Uh, tonight we're we're honored to have Dr. Stephen L. Driver. Driever. Driever. Sorry. Watch me close tonight. Driever. Uh, uh, who is a professor emeritus in geography. His, his degree is in geography from the University of Virginia, VA, Northwestern University for uh, MS, and the University of Georgia for PhD. He taught over 40 years at the University of Missouri, Kansas City, except for a year in Spain as a Fulbright senior researcher and a year in Mexico as a visiting professor. He's going to tell us about that in another day, right? Mm -hmm. yeah, sounds interesting. Um, while at the university, or while at the UMKC, he served as the chair of the geosciences department. As director of the university's urban studies program, as president of the Kansas City chapter of Sigma Psi, Sigma, 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 yeah, uh, the science uh, research honor association. I'm in that too, by the way. Good. And and as a president of the University of Missouri Kansas City's chapter of the honorary society uh, Phi Kappa Phi, he has presented. Oh, this is what blows my mind right here. Okay. How do you do all this stuff? Persistence, right? Persistence. Okay. He has presented at over six. Uh, he's presented over sixty conference papers, and has published over eighty academic articles and two books. For uh, for the Plano chapter uh, SAR, he has served as secretary in two thousand twenty one. And as president in 2022, he has six ancestors who fought the American Revolution. Steve was a Marine, having served on active duty from 1970 to 1973, and uh, and in the inactive reserves from 1973 to 1976. His military occupation, occupation especially, was artillery. Uh, his final rank was captain. First, thank you for your service. So, without further ado, I'll turn it over to uh, Stephen, and he will tell you about what he's going to talk about. Thank you. That's virtually true. If this were to be out. There's somebody here. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Oh, you got to put the projector on before the computer. So, oh, that makes it. I'll use that. It's put the projector on. Okay, let's see. Okay, it's going to be so I'll come up here. 
I think you're going to sleep. All right, I see it. Okay. There's hope. Got one up. Yeah, I see it. See what it does. Yeah, yes, please. Okay. Well, thank you, Tom, for yeah. the introduction, and thank everybody for coming here despite the ominous weather predictions. I hope tonight some of you can learn a few things new, and if you maybe more than a few things new, at least everybody something new. So today I'll talk about the geography of the American Revolution part one from Lexington to Valley Forge. We got a part two, which we need to do sometime. And get the automatic deal out here. So there are many precursors to the American Revolution. This is just a partial list, but let me try to relate this geographically to different groups. The proclamation line of 1763 which of course is this line right here the white settlers were not supposed to go beyond that that really upset two groups of people big land investors like george washington and ben franklin and also the frontier men or sometimes called the over the mountain men who of course always wanted to push westward and get more land as well uh, so that upset them the Currency Act, which banned paper money, angered the Tidewater planters, made them very patriotic. So we're talking about people generally, of course, from Virginia, not so many of the planters in North Carolina, and a lot also in South Carolina. They were very patriotic. Uh, revenue acts, of course, got people all upset, perhaps not fairly in a way, because a lot of this was to pay off the costs of the French and Indian War, which were largely borne by people living in Great Britain. The taxes in the colonies were quite light. And so the British government thought, well, you know, these colonists should pay more because that war was largely fought on their behalf over there in North America. But the colonists, of course, didn't see it that way. Then we have groups of Sons of Liberty forming and bought. Austin in 1765, and this took off like hotcakes. It was all the way down to Georgia by 1766. So this probably included the most radical people in favor of uh, greater independence from Great Britain. Then we have the whole fact of the British infantry regiments being sent to Boston, and of course, in the course of acts in 1774, we have four regiments basically in the city of Boston. And of course they could quarter in anybody's house, whether they liked it or not. So this really enraged the leaders of Massachusetts and Virginia, the two most important colonies. And perhaps more importantly, it got everybody else in the colonies kind of sympathetic to these New Englanders who historically they kind of saw as sharp traders and they didn't really like them very much, but now this made them sympathetic to the New Englanders. So we have our first Continental Congress, actually in 1774, September 5th, 1774, and the subject resolves four days later that month, September 9th, which further suggested various boycotts and arming of militias. And before this time, really up until 1774, so I've said it's because they still viewed themselves as royal British subjects. Now, the hot war begins really with 700 British troops on the way to Concord through the Lexington Common, shown there at number five, up at the northwest end of the map there. The militia commander was outnumbered. He had about seven men by the time the British showed up there. The British had about 700. So he ordered his men to disperse. Well, they did. They went to either side of the commons, shown in the inset down here, but they refused to lay down their arms. And of course, that got the commander of the British unit very upset, saying, damn it, you know, lay down your arms. And then a shot's fired. Nobody knows who fired the first shot, but the shot was fired. And it was a disaster for the Minutemen in Lexington, because the British all had their muskets loaded and ready to go just in case. 
And of course, they hit off the quick place and killed eight patriots and wounded, as opposed to just one British combatant being wounded. So this excited uh, the British troops there, they had a little victory celebration, fired off the victory volley, and then marched on toward Concord, uh, eager to try to seize arms and ammunition there, as well as to arrest the Patriot leaders, Sam Adams and John Hancock, who were supposedly there now in Concord. So April 19, 1775, the hot war begins and a disaster at the end for the British. The survivors of Lexington sound the alarm. To arms, to arms, the war has begun. Hundreds of militia confront the British in Concord, and now the British are outnumbered. And in searching buildings for armed caches, the British burn down two buildings, angering the militiamen who see this from a distant hill and think, my God, they're burning down the whole town. We can't allow this to happen. So they move off their hill and go to the North Bridge and go to the west side of it there, shown in two, where the American militia is, to prevent the British from crossing that bridge and getting at the arms and cash there. And at the North Bridge, there's a big confrontation after a shot whizzes past the ear of a militiaman who cries, quote, God damn it, they're firing ball, unquote. The Americans respond by killing 12 redcoats and the British killed two Americans. The British retreat the disaster, and well, most of us know that story. That's a big defeat for them. Uh, at the various locations there, shown with, shown with arrows, the uh, Patriots are hiding behind houses, walls, trees, etc., firing at the British as they retreat, and they're doing that again here in this section on their way back to Boston. So by the time we get back to Boston, they lost 273 men, 40% of their force that had been sent to Concord versus a loss of only 95 men for the Americans. The war has begun and the British now know that it's going to be something of a challenge. Now, there's some very important military artists. I think perhaps the most important living military artist is Don Troiani of Connecticut who likes to paint uh, all kinds of military scenes from the uh, revolution going all the way up through the Civil War. And here he depicts Captain Isaac Davis there in the blue coat of Acton, Massachusetts, ordering his men to fire back on the British on the east side of North Bridge. And these militia killed the first British soldier of the Revolutionary War. Unfortunately for the captain there, he is also killed because of course, People are always aiming at the officers first. The poet Ralph Waldo Emerson calls the event later, quote, the shot heard round the world, unquote. And the farmers could rout an elite British force really haunted Sir William Howe, then commander in chief of the British army in North America. Now this takes us to the siege of Boston. So we see the city, sorry, we see the city of Boston here. and. It it's connected to land by a little neck here called the Boston Neck. So we can see the British here have five infantry divisions here in Boston itself. And later, the Americans have a total here of nine divisions, keeping them tied up in Boston. So they basically outnumbered the British by a little more than two to one here in their siege of Boston, which takes place between April of 1775 and March 1776. Now, in the beginning, the forces are under nominal command of Artemis Ward, General Artemis Ward from Shrewsbury, Massachusetts. Not that he's really in control of all of these troops, but he's the senior officer. He has the largest force, so nominally he's in charge, but it's still a bit disorganized. All they can agree on is keeping the British bottled up here. Responding to this, on May 25th, a frigate arrives in Boston Harbor with Major Generals William Howe, Henry Clinton, and John Burgoyne getting off at Long Wharf, shown right here, and there to advise uh, the uh, British off and officer in charge there, Thomas Gage, how to put a quick end to the rebellion. On June 10th, the Continental Congress designates 
the American forces besieging Boston as the Continental Army and makes this a reality by ordering troops from Pennsylvania, Maryland, and Virginia north as reinforcements. This certainly broadens the conflict to most of the colonies. And George Washington of Virginia is appointed as the commanding general to please the South. Virginia then, I believe, was still the largest colony in population, and it was considered important to get somebody outside of Massachusetts to command the Continental Army to encourage other colonies to support the revolution. Now, by midsummer, we have 6,500 British troops being blocked by an estimated 15,000 to 18,000 rebels under Washington. And basically, they're, they're keeping them from uh, escaping this way by the force up here, and they can't go down through the deck because of Ward's force down here. They can't just take boats across the bay here because of Putnam's force here. So it's pretty well set up. And the British, trying to break out of this, decide that they're going to try to fortify Dorchester Heights here, land here at the neck, and then fortify the heights right in here, this way commanding Boston Harbor and being able to hone in their artillery on the Americans. But the Americans learn of this effort and uh, we'll see what that means. Then on June 16th, the Americans fortified Bunker Hill and Breeds Hill, which is closer to Boston, but lower by 35 feet. And the battle itself really takes place on Breeds Hill, but we call it the Battle of Bunker's Hill, as it's been called ever since the days of the Revolution. On June 17th, Howe leads three assaults against the Americans on Breeds Hill, and the Americans equip themselves very well in the first two assaults, but they run out of ammunition and have to retreat, being covered by those forces over here. And of course, as they retreat, this means that the British win. But in the end, 1,054 Brits were killed versus only 440 American casualties. Major General Clinton says, quote, a dear Walt Fitch day, another such would have ruined us. Well, I love to show paintings of this sometime. Of course, we don't have photography. Here's a painting by John Trumbull entitled The Death of General Warren at the Battle of Bunker's Hill, which he did in 1786. Now, almost everybody in this painting is an actual individual obviously known to trouble or he couldn't have painted that person <laughs> and he must have had a very good memory to be able to do this i'll just point out a few of the many figures here this of course is dr warren dr joseph warren who became the first martyr here really of, of the revolution he was one of the leading radicals president of the provincial <laughs> congress of massachusetts uh, really on a par with uh, Sam Adams, John Adams, and people like that. Uh, had quite a bit of the work to work in rousing people up. Uh, and he was a major general at this point in the militia, but he decided, you know what, I'll let Artemis Ward, Artemis Ward uh, lead the defense here, and I'll just fight as an ordinary soldier. And of course, he ends up getting killed, hit with a musket ball right in the head. And uh, so in this picture here, let's see, we have over here is Artemis Ward over here. Uh, this, I think, is uh, Clinton over here. And this is William Howe over here. And uh, gosh, every almost everybody here is an actual person. And uh, as you can see here, a British grenadier is getting ready to bayonet uh, the dying uh, Dr. Warren here. And uh, a British officer here stops him from bayoneting him. Uh, so what this painting does is uh, they, they call it, uh, I think a good uh, explanation of this would be uh, sub sublimity, romantic sublimity. The idea here is to awe the spectator of the painting and uh, get them in a very emotional state 
uh, so that they all become one with the scene. And of course, the, the people in the conflict here are very close uh, to the uh, observer here of the painting, which makes it that much uh, stronger. And uh, interestingly here, he depicts the English and the Americans as kind of an equal here at, at this point. Uh, either one is considered immoral versus the other being moral. They're both considered in this painting as, as equally uh, courageous. Now, granted, this is painting, and this painting now is at the Yale Art Museum, and that would not have been accessible to a lot of people when this was first done in 1786. But he later had uh, prints made of this, and prints continued to be made of this at least through the 1820s. So eventually it did become widely available to the average American, and, and uh, of course became a very rallying point here uh, for people thinking about it. And of course it made old Dr. Warren there dying uh, into a, a martyr. And interestingly, here he's got another person here who might be considered a martyr here. This was actually the commander of the British Marines here, who's being held by his son as his father dies in his arms. So again, this, this creates uh, equal sympathy here for the Americans and the, uh, and the English. Now, we digress now a little bit to the Northern Campaign. Uh, Canada was always in the back of the minds of the revolutionists. Of course, they wanted Canada to come in on the side of the colonies against the British. They invited Canada to do this, but Canada was cool to the idea. They didn't want to do that. So Ethan Allen, leader of the Green Mountain Boys from Vermont, and Colonel Benedict Arnold want to invade Canada to prevent a northern invasion coming down from Canada of British troops reinforced with many Indians. Both the British and Americans know the importance of these natural waterways here, uh, over here uh, to the uh, west. But of course, uh, that would have been a difficult route to follow to go attack Canada because of all the forts there, and they would have run into opposition from British who controlled some of the forts. So they have this idea that they can go up using this alternate route here, uh, which supposedly was surveyed and was not that difficult. Ha uh, ha uh, ha. Uh. And uh, they go up that route, but they find it very, very difficult going. The, uh, they get bogged down, for instance, here in the, in the middle of it, about the half, of, half the men abandoned the attack. And all they manage to do when they finally get up there to Canada is they do take Fort St. John's from there at one, and then they do also take Montreal shown at, at uh, two. Now, so August 1775, Washington offers Arnold the command of this expedition against the Citadel of Quebec. And as I said, the route goes through this other route that was supposedly wide open, but they found that they got bogged down there. And by October, so we're going September, October, this is a good two months later on, they're only up to about point one there of the Dead River facing terrible conditions. And as I said before, about half the men abandoned the project. The remaining 600 reached Point Levy there at two across from the Quebec on the south side of the St. Lawrence River. Now they hoped to rendezvous with Americans from Montreal to attack Quebec from the north and south, but the Southern force retreats when General Montgomery is killed. The Northern force under Captain Daniel Morgan then surrenders on January 1st, 1776. This is the first true major defeat of the Americans in the war. And here's another painting by John Trumbull, and this is entitled Death of General Montgomery in the Attack on Quebec. And this painting was done in 1786. And of course, uh, Richard Montgomery, General Richard Montgomery, shown there dying, he'd been hit by grape shot from a cannon. If you wanted to really scatter the troops or do as much damage as possible, killing and wounding people instead of this cannon wall, put grape shot and cannon and, and fire. The British often did that. So here he is dying in the arms of one of his captains. We have other dead Americans down here. 
and uh, some other Americans obviously by their dress over here. Not exactly sure where the British are here, but we can see he's dying on the snow, and the whole idea here is to make this look very cold and forbidding. And it also turns General Montgomery now into another martyr of the uh, revolution. Now, the siege of Washington, getting back to that, this is going on the whole time that that northern expedition is going on. Gordon in Cambridge, during the winter of 1775 to 76, Washington is alarmed over the depletion of American arms. So he sends Colonel Henry Knox, who was a bookseller in Boston, of all things, sort of a jovial, overweight fellow, who turned out to be one of Washington's best officers and his main artillery officer. Washington sends him to Fort Ticonderoga, saying, see what you can do, bring back as many cannons as possible. Two months later, Knox returns to Boston with over 60 mortars and cannons mounted on big ox pulled sleds. And he has managed to move these sleds with his heavy weight more than 300 miles over snow and ice, truly kind of a miracle of the revolution. On the night of March 4th to 5th, 1776, 3,000 Americans and the oxen dragged the big guns, barrels, and pre-assembled ramparts up to the top of Dorchester Heights, which we saw in the map before, kind of to the southeast of the city of Boston and across Boston Bay. At dawn on March 5th, the British realized, oh, Dorchester Heights is now an American fortress. That is something the British wanted to do themselves. And they decided, you know what, we need to attack this. But a snowstorm prevented their assault on the Dorchester Heights. And on March 17, 9,000 redcoats and many loyalists flee Boston in some 120 ships sailing to Halifax, Nova Scotia, never to return to Boston. Washington's maiden victory, as we can imagine, rallies the nation. Now this, of course, is Washington here looking through a uh, telescope. Not sure, but this should be Henry Knox over here, but I'm not sure who that is. It could be Charles Lee, I don't know. And we can see this is the heights are not that high. It goes up to about 100 feet above sea level. And uh, here's the city of Boston. And this looks like uh, one of the big cans, maybe an 18 pounder. And you can see from this height, hmm. they could blast away the ships in the harbor. So Washington had an agreement uh, with the British when they fled Boston. If you don't burn down the city of Boston as you leave it, we will not fire on your ships. We'll allow you free passage to Halifax. And both kept their words on that. Now the action moves to New York, unavoidable being the major city and population at this time. Uh, so we'll spend some time talking about this. From late June 1776 to mid-July, Britain sends an armada carrying 32,000 troops to New York Harbor under General William Howe. You can see the 32,000 troops initially down here on, on Staten Island. And through the summer, Washington raises 28,000 troops in New York but still has no naval forces. Washington could be outflanked by the sea, yet he thought New York too politically important not to try to defend it. And truth be known, Congress, the Continental Congress, wanted him to defend New York City. So he was always a person who thought the civilian should control the military. So he did not want to challenge that wish. Now, the key real estate to defend here was Brooklyn Heights, simply because that was the highest elevation here, close to what was in New York City over in here. And so Washington tries to defend it, but he's badly outnumbered. And he retreats after Howe sends half his force across the river here. And uh, then they go up here. And while he has various passes defended here, this pass, the Jamaica Pass, is not defended. And the British learned this through a spy. There was all kinds of spying and counter spying going on by both sides throughout the revolution. Washington decided when he realized 
that the British got through this Jamaica Pass, you know, I need to get more troops over from Manhattan now to defend Brooklyn Heights. But then he realizes he doesn't really have enough to defend it compared to House 32,000 troops. So he decides, whoops, I think I made a mistake. I think we need to get boats and try to retreat back to Manhattan. So he orders all boats from New Jersey be commandeered and a regiment of seamen from Massachusetts, fortunately, were with him at this time. And they managed to get all 9,000 plus American soldiers to retreat across the East River over here back to Manhattan in darkness on the evening of August 29th and the early morning, morning hours of August 30th. The American general Israel Putnam's division retreats north to Harlem. See here, the Battle of Harlem is up in here. And uh, on September 16th, the Americans win that battle, and this makes their spirits soar. But after the Battle of Harlem, Heights, how those 4,000 troops northeastward, make the long story short, through one, two, three, and four, plus picking up FCN reinforcements here in New Rochelle, New York. Washington already started to move his 14,500 men, however, to White Plains up at five, leaving a smaller force in Fort Washington and at, at Fort Lee. So we see Fort Washington here, Fort Lee across the Hudson River here. When the American militia holding Chatterton Hill at five break, however, around, I want to say, Fort Washington, then he has to retreat from there and uh, retreats across the Hudson River to Peekskill, New York, which is north of our map, and then turns south, going through New Jersey. On November 16, 2,800 Americans left at Fort Washington, surrendered to Howe. Now, after the surrender of Fort Washington, Howe sends Cornwallis across the Hudson at nine to seize Fort Lee. So again, whoops, here's Fort Washington here. Howe's moving his forces across here, going down here toward Fort Lee to seize it. So Green, realizing he's way outnumbered, has to uh, retreat from the fort with his men, but has to leave most of his equipment, has no way to move that. And Green rendezvous with Washington and Hackensack at eight, and they and about 3,500 men were left, flee to Newark with Cornwallis hot in their pursuit. Uh, Cornwallis is a very important figure right up to the Battle of Yorktown, probably the most effective of the British generals. The New York campaign is thus a disaster for the Americans. Washington has been outmaneuvered by Howe. He should probably not have divided up his forces, which were already inferior in number, into two bodies against the larger force of Howe. And he only has 3,500 effectives left. That means men who are healthy enough to fight. And half of them are ready to go home at the end of their enlistments in December. This is a problem Washington continually faced. A lot of the volunteers and the militia in the Continental Army, their enlistment was up at the end of December. Then everybody, the officers would have to scurry around trying to find replacements for them. So the Patriots really faced a crisis at this point. Washington has lost most of his men by the time he reaches Newark. And not only does he have Cornwallis on his tail, but also the American Major General Charles Lee begins now to undermine Washington. Charles Lee was a professional British soldier before he moved to America and decided to throw his blood in with the Patriots. But he was always resentful of Washington, because after all, Washington, when he was appointed commanding general during the French and Indian War, had just been a colonel of a Virginia militia. Whereas, after all, Lee was an officer in the British Army, and he felt he shouldn't have been appointed to be 
commanding general of the Continental Army. So this takes us down to Trenton in Washington's retreat by December 25th, 1776. By December 18th, the two armies faced each other across the Delaware River there, shown at point three here. And Cornwallis has 10,000 well-equipped troops. The Americans have less than half that number and are in bad shape. But as is the British tradition, how orders the British troops into winter quarters, which usually means spending them in the nearest large city. So how returns to New York where you can enjoy the theater, concerts, et cetera, and enjoy mistresses, et cetera. Cornwallis plans a winter leave in England. So while Washington and his remaining troops are ensconced on the Pennsylvania side of the Delaware River, he gets a little boost from Thomas Paine reading his crisis to the American troops on December 23rd, which is basically a pamphlet and uh, really fired up the men, basically telling them, look, you can run, put down your arms now and leave and be a coward, or you can fight for your country and uh, be honored forever in life and death as a true patriot. It's your choice. So they get kind of fired up. And afraid that Americans would quit the revolution, Washington then plans a very bold three-pronged assault on Trenton for December 25th. He's in search of a victory before those enlistments are up. It's that simple. But his idea was that his forces would cross the Delaware in three different locations, one down here, one up here, and one over here. And uh, it didn't work out. Uh, in the southern part, and let me make sure I get this right here. No, in the middle here, Ewing uh, decided the Delaware River was too rough to cross there at Trenton Ferry and hold the bridge on the other side of uh, the Delaware River in Trenton, which as we'll see was a significant problem later. And the Lieutenant Colonel Caldwell Otter down in the south was supposed to get our children across the Delaware. And he did, but then he later recrosses it back to Pennsylvania, considering the whole thing too difficult. Only Washington's men and artillery make it across the Delaware River and are ready to attack Trent now. There's a lot of mythology out there that they got the Hessians on Christmas Day, and of course they were drunk and had been celebrating and were not ready for this. That is not true. They were professional soldiers. They were not asleep. They were not hungover. And they were not surprised at Washington's attack because they had sentence set, of course. Colonel John Rawl, Johann Wall, excuse me, commander of the Hessians of Trenton, knew the attack was coming thanks to these sentinels on the main roads. But the problem was his Hessians were outnumbered and outgunned when Washington's forces attacked. And so the Hessians have to retreat and they retreat to an orchard. And that's kind of shown here on the inset map. Here we have Trenton, and you can see Wall's only got 1,400 troops here. And so they kind of retreat, fall back, fall back, and then they realize, whoops, we got to go back this way and maybe go to the orchard here and make our last stand here. But as we'll see, that doesn't work out. This is another Don Triani painting depicting the mortal wounding of Hesse Colonel Johann Rawl, who struggled to mount a counterattack against the Americans in the orchard in Trenton. And so he had different uh, forces there, some with red facing on their coats, some with orange facing on their coats. 22 Hessians are killed, over 900 Hessians surrender after Colonel Rawl is mortally wounded, and about 500 Hessians unfortunately escape over the bridge that Brigadier General Ewing was supposed to have secured, but didn't because he did not cross the Delaware. A British officer afterward observed, quote, though it was once the fashion of this British army to treat Americans in the most contemptible light, they are now become a formidable enemy. <laughs> now, who were these Hessians? Okay, the Hessians come from, quote, unquote, principalities, but they were different kinds of political units 
basically little remnants of the old Holy Roman Empire. And uh, most of them came from the two principalities, Hess Castle and Hess Hanon, but they also came from the other ones uh, shown on this map. The Germans and the British needed each other. Great Britain needed the German soldiers to supplement its army, which they had to downsize after the French and Indian War, or what they called the Seven Years War, because they just couldn't afford it. They knew they wanted to maintain the strength of their Navy, which was the best in the world, and to do that, they had to downsize the army. But on a short-term basis, they could pay these Hessians to fight for them as mercenaries, and 34,000 did crossing the Atlantic to fight in our revolution. They were professional soldiers, and uh, they were much respected and feared by the compatriots, but they learned how to fight against them pretty quickly. Only 44% of these Hessians ever returned to their homelands in what today is Germany. Uh, they, they suffered many casualties. Some chose voluntarily to stay in the United States, often in Southeast Pennsylvania, and, and others who were captured, again, often placed in Southeast Pennsylvania, decided to stay there after being released from prison at the end of the revolutionary conflict. So here's a picture of a typical Hessian with his big fancy brass plated hat and uh, one of their little ditties that they would sing. I don't know the uh, song that goes with this the melody, but quote, go with us to America. There will be enough for all. There will be silver, gold, and money, everything that a man seeks the world, unquote. And over there on the right, they shot a Brunswick camp follower during the Saratoga campaign, painting based on an eyewitness description uh, from a wife of one of the uh, Patriot soldiers from Boston. Uh, they were wives, sometimes daughters. They often worked for money. And they came to America simply because they were too poor to stay at home. Their husbands didn't own land like the farmers in the United States, they had to work for some aristocrat. So from Trenton, we move on to Princeton, New Jersey on January 2nd, 1777. Washington lacking all its forces after the victory at Trenton has to recross the Delaware River there at, uh, at one and uh, regroup and the Hessians retreat east off the map that weren't captured. Uh, but Howe cancels Cornwallis's winter leave to England and orders him into New Jersey with 8,000 men to stop the rebellion once and for all. Cornwallis arrives in Trenton, there are three, on January 1st, 1777. And uh, he rests, thinking, well, you know, Washington's not going to go anywhere because the Delaware River is to his back. But Washington, always the clever fox evading the British, leaves a decoy contention on the hills down here to the south of the Assunpink River and tells them, build bonfires, beat your drums, play your fights, make them think that there are a lot of troops here on the hills. Meanwhile, the main force slips out to the north, uh, going here from four all the way up here to five and six and uh at five there we have a little confrontation between lieutenant colonel charles mawood's british forces uh, going from princeton to reinforce trenton engaging general u mercer's uh, battalion um, but washington called off the american pursuit of the british realizing look we don't want to attack trenton we want to attack princeton and have another victory under our belts. So he allows many of the British to escape eastward off the map. What is left of the orphaned British regiment at Princeton is at Nassau Hall. They're shown at uh, six way up here. And uh, they surrender after Captain Alexander Hamilton's artillery barrage. They just took a couple of uh, cannon shots from uh, Alexander Hamilton's artillery, as well as his ordering charge against Nassau Hall, and the British and Hessians hold up in that building and surrender. So the fighting for the winter is over. Washington winners in Morristown 
New Jersey. Now, at this point, Washington's a hero. Trenton and Princeton make all the difference in the way that the world perceives the American Revolution. Uh, Frederick the Great, one of the great military leaders and political leaders of Europe at this time, praises Washington, saying that the victories of Trenton and Princeton were some of the greatest military victories of all time. And they've been overstated, but anyway, it sounded good. And the loyalist diarist here, Nicholas Cresswell, writes, quote, now they are all liberty mad again, unquote. And this painting is done by the so-called patriot painter, Charles Wilson Peel, who fought at Trenton and Princeton, actually met Washington and painted his portrait here in 1779 down at Mount Vernon on commission from the Supreme Executive Council of Philadelphia. And uh, we have Nassau Hall there in the background. And there is, I believe, the surrendering British there uh, being marched wherever they're put. And Washington here has his hands on a cannon. Well, it doesn't look like a very big one, maybe a six pounder cannon. And he's wearing a blue sash at this time because I don't believe they had the stars yet on their epithets. Uh, later, Washington ditches the blue sash and replaces it with three silver stars for his rank as a lieutenant general. So that's one way to date this uh, this painting. Uh, Peel was a great portraitist, and he did later paintings very similar to this one, but you can tell they were done later because Washington does not wear the blue sash on those paintings. Hmm. Now, let's look at the theater here in, in New York. I really can't talk about Saratoga tonight. That would be a whole uh, lecture in itself. And we'll look at the general background to the Battle of Saratoga. Burgoyne had a plan, which was really not new to him, it had been kicking around in England for some time, that because England was the center of disaffection with the motherland, it, if it could be cut off from the other colonies in one massive campaign, this would be the decisive blow against the American Revolution. And any campaign coming from Canada of course, the most likely path would be right down here, largely a liquid path through rivers and Lake Champlain, another river here, and Lake George, and right down to the Hudson River. It wasn't all smooth sailing, there were some portages, but most of it you could travel on boats. And, and this was important because this area at the time was really frontier. I mean, it was the backwoods. It lacked proper roads, and oftentimes the roads were blocked with fallen trees, often by the patriots. French and Indian war forts uh, also uh, could be secured by going down uh, through this path. So we're, we're going to envision this, and he, then he envisioned another movement, kind of in a pincer's fashion. They're shown in, in two, with Colonel Barry St. Leger, moving up the St. Lawrence River to Lake Ontario, then uh, moving uh, from Oswego, New York, down the Oswego River, and uh, then after a short portage, moving down the Mohawk River, all of this through the Mohawk Valley, and the two prongs of the British attack would meet up at Albany, shown there at uh, four. Albany may be only really important interior city there in the general New England area. And to complicate matters for the Patriots, as New York forces were to move up the Hudson River, mainly as a diversion. Now, Howe didn't do this because he decides to go down toward Philadelphia, but Clinton slept in his place and Clinton did execute the diversion somewhat by going up as far as uh, three here on the, uh, on the map. <clears throat> So let's uh, look at the prong of the invasion under Colonel Barry St. Leger. The big battle there was the Battle of Oriskany, kind of in the middle of the Mohawk Valley between the Oswego River and the Mohawk River near Fort Stanwyck. Uh, the obstacle here was Fort Stanwyck, uh, which guarded the passage uh, between the two rivers. And so St. Leger decided to lay siege to the fort. And in response, American Colonel Nicholas Herkimer, 
who commanded the Tryon County Militia in New York, those of all the men in that county between ages 16 and 60 were able to serve. And learning of the militia's approach from the east, St. Leger sends 400 Indians under Chief Joseph Brandt, as well as a company of Hestana Yaga, Yaga, and some loyalists to ambush the militia. Well, the militia and the Oneida scouts, the Oneida were the one Iroquois troop that remained allied with the uh, American patriots. And the militia and the Oneida scouts fight the enemy to a standstill at great cost. The American general, Major General Schuler, sends Benedict Arnold with 900 Continentals to relieve Fort Stanwix. And learning of this, the Indians abandoned the British. And when they abandoned the British, St. Leger has to retreat back through Canada. Now, this takes us down to the Philadelphia area. And there's some very important battles here, which again, because of time, I don't really have uh, a chance to discuss here. But we have Brandywine, Yoli, and Germantown, all major battles. And Washington just can't stop the British in these battles. And so, of course, they're able to occupy uh, Philadelphia, which creates a huge problem, of course, because that's the seat of our Congress and the de facto capital of the new United States. Washington hopes to isolate Howe's army in Philadelphia by controlling the roads in and out of Philadelphia by holding on to two forts there, Fort Mercer over here and Fort Mifflin over here on an island. And uh, Howe responds by pulling his forces back from Germantown, which today is in northern Philadelphia, but at that time is a separate community. And he fortifies Webb's Ferry there at four, and this allows him to move some artillery over here to Province Island and bombard the Fort Mifflin from Province Island. And this leads to the fall of Fort Mifflin, leaving only Fort Mercer there under Confederate control. And uh, when Cornwallis moves across the Delaware here at seven to get ready to attack the fort here, obviously the men in the fort know they're outnumbered and they basically have to, uh, have to retreat. So as the British settle in and take control of uh, Philadelphia, there's some skirmishing afterwards, some 13 miles northwest of Philadelphia, but Washington decides he has to retreat to Valley Forge, some 20 miles north of northwest of Philadelphia. And uh, this is a, one of my favorite paintings of the revolution by William Trago, a famous painter of uh, the late 19th, early 20th century, who uh, was a great painter, but never got rich because of it. I think the most accurate painting of what it probably looked like, at least marching to Valley Forge. Uh, the Revolutionary War, again, is not pursued in the winter. The British and Hessian officers enjoy Philadelphia, of course, and, and New York City. Uh, Washington in, in Valley Forge uh, says, you know, this was the most difficult decision of my life, but he figured by going there, he'd be close enough to Philadelphia to keep an eye on the British and ready to attack them when they would decide to leave it. And this would also keep the Brits from foraging the farms of Southeast Pennsylvania, which is very, very fertile, rich farmland. And it was far enough away from Philadelphia to prevent a surprise attack by house forces moving out of Philadelphia. So Valley Forge also had the advantage of allowing Washington to protect the Congress in York, Pennsylvania, and the capital now, Pennsylvania, and Lancaster. They build over 2,000 cabins to accommodate 12,000 men, plus probably about 2,000 or so camp followers, many of them women, some children. This becomes literally the fourth largest city now in the United States after Boston, New York, and uh, Philadelphia, larger than Newport or Charleston. 12 enlisted men are squeezed into each cabin. There were triple bunk beds on two walls of the cabin, fireplace on the third wall, the long wall, and then an entrance way on the fourth wall. And uh, so you had two men uh, to a bunk bed, 
and uh, it wasn't luxurious to say the least. And uh, many of them didn't have proper clothing. Even some of the officers uh, walked around only with blankets to cover themselves. And on most days, the only food available was fire cakes, a simple combination of lard, water, and flour. By winter's end, 2,000 men had perished, most of them from disease, but things were looking up also by winter's end. Lafayette was given a division to command. Baron von Steuben arrived in camp uh, during that winter from uh, Europe. And uh, this was absolutely critical. I get more into that in my talk too on the revolution. And uh, finally, France became an open ally of the Americans. So now they're not only aiding them with arms, ammunition, uniforms, maybe some money, and now, of course, the ships and troops. So that's a very important difference. And that's the end. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Any yeah. questions that I maybe can't answer? Thanks for the back. Um, okay. You talked about a Providence Island there toward the end of your, of your talk there around Philadelphia. Yeah. And so, was it had that island? Was that island inhabited? It had been there for a while. It was one of the very early settlements. Oh, Providence Island? Pro, is it Providence or Providence? Providence. Providence Island. Okay. P R O B I N C E. Okay. Yes. So I believe that's uninhabited, as you can see. It's okay. The trade here is okay. Long. Okay. So I can't imagine the people living on that. Oh, okay. 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 Thank you. Any other questions? Okay. Yes. I was going to say, I grew up on Long Island. And uh, my ancestor is Private Peter W. Hubble, who was uh, born and raised up in Jefferson, New York, which is up uh, about 150 miles southwest of Albany. And he didn't join the New York contingent. He enlisted in the Connecticut militia. Yeah. <laughs> because they paid strip to the soldiers and they also paid new for <laughs> Yeah. That, that's not unusual because, especially when they're enlisting, for up a lot of men would, would see if they could get a better deal somewhere else. Mm -hmm. Like one of my ancestors fought revolutions from Massachusetts, but he was attached to the Connecticut group there for a while, for a couple of months. So, you know, probably some of that was getting a better deal, perhaps. Maybe some of them were going home, wanted uh, a place where there'd be more action. I don't know. Any other questions or comments? Okay, thank you very much. Okay, thank you. Very good. Step out here. I have a certificate of appreciation for you. Uh, and thank you so much for coming. And, and we'll, we'll schedule maybe in the fall of your part two. Okay. And uh, can I ask you to send me a picture of this one? Sure. Send it to our after. Okay. Thank you. Steve, thank you so much. Appreciate you coming out here. Appreciate you. Before you sit down, oh, I'll cut it. You. Yes. Tom Bio, when he read about you, mentioned you were in the military yes. in the 70s. Yes. Have you ever been presented the Vietnam Air Lapel Camp? Yeah, I, I've got it. And I'm okay. getting the nice, nice little certificate that I guess the national <laughs> hands well, out. Sure you got that. Um, our next meeting in the Plano chapter. Thank you for asking. Yeah. Thank you so much. As far as um, announcements in the old business, um, coming up this weekend, we have the great marking ceremony. This is for James Lemon. It's on the back of your program. And this is going to be in Lancaster, Texas. That's probably about an hour to an hour and a half from McKinney. It is supposed to start at three o'clock, and it's anticipated there may be uh, approximately 200 people that will be there on, on that day. Um, so, you may want to wear comfortable shoes if you can go, maybe bring a folding chair. The, the cemetery is called the Edgewood Cemetery. And uh, on the back, it further explains he was a Revolutionary War veteran, a War of 1812 
veteran and a citizen of the Republic of Texas. So hopefully uh, you'll be able to, to, uh, to go to that. Um, as far as new business, the 2023 annual conference is March the 30th through April the 2nd of Spring, Texas. And I assume that some people will be, be going there for our chapter. Who all, is anyone going to go? I am. Tom, okay, great. So um, if anyone's interested, you can reach out to me or to, to TL or to Tom uh, concerning, concerning that conference. Does anyone else have any old business right now? Be great. Um, our next meeting will be April the 20th. We'll again be here at Spring Creek. Um, looking forward to new business. The minutes from February are posted on the website. So hopefully you all have had a chance to to review those. Does anybody have any questions or comments concerning the minutes? Do I have a motion to approve the minutes? I like that motion. Uh, Tom makes a motion. Uh, second. Uh, Peter makes a second. With that, uh, all in favor of approving the minutes from February, say aye. 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 Any opposed? Wonderful. Minutes are approved. Uh, next, we would have the treasurer's reports, and Peter Ford uh, is available, but he's here by Zoom. Yeah. So, do I try to do that, or Tom, do you want to try to do that for us? Peter, do you want to do that? Sure, do I can do that. Can you hear me okay? Oh, yeah. Yes, we can hear you. Excellent. Okay, so here's the treasurer's report for March 16th, 2023. Our bank balance says that the last meeting was $7,409.85. This month, we received $111.50 from the Texas Society for 2022 application fees and membership dues. Our expenses for the month are $600 for teacher awards and $235 for metal pur purchases. That's bringing our available balance to $6,686.35. And then uh, please note that Amazon ended their Amazon Smile program in February. We'll no longer be receiving donations from them. That's it of the report. Anybody have any questions? Uh, Peter, we have no questions. Thank you so much for using the Silicon Valley Bank. Oh, which one were you? So with that, uh, we will now have uh, Peter McClellan from the Audit Committee. He's the Audit, audit Committee Chairman of the rest of Well, I wanted uh, everybody to know that uh, uh, the internal Audit Committee that consists of myself and my very able uh, audit assistant, Blaise Uribe, met with uh, Treasurer Peter Ford, and, uh, and that happened on uh, February 23rd, and uh, we did a, a review of uh, the financial records that were kept in the uh, chapter file, and uh, we, we sampled information from that. We took a look at the March, May, June, and uh, this recent January statement uh, and reviewed uh, the bank statements against the checkbook and uh, information that was available. And we really found uh, no material uh, errors uh, in that um, review. Uh, and it was also noted that Peter Ford assumed his position uh, as of May 1st of uh, 2022. So uh, we think that uh, Peter's done an excellent job in maintaining the uh, accounts of our chapter and, and uh, don't see any problem. Uh, we did notice that the October 2022 financial statement was missing from the SAR file. That will be reprinted. Uh, it was discussed that the chapter should consider adopting a dual signature requirement uh, procedure, if you will, 
for any chapter check prepared for $500 or more. And uh, we presented that uh, issue to the executive committee and under consideration as to what we're going to go forward with that. Um, no financial errors were noted in the reports that were reviewed. And uh, we, we surmise that the process of posting and generating reports appears to meet all uh, requirements. Uh, we did ask the Texar Treasurer uh, via email to provide guidance as to how long the chapter must retain financial records before being shredded. So we want to get some guidance from uh, up above to tell us uh, if we can reduce the size of the file, uh, it's continually to grow with monthly statements. Maybe we can keep a log and those uh, statements and information that are greater than five or six years old, we can run through the shredder. So that's under consideration. Um, we did render an opinion on the financial statements and the internal control over the financial reporting. We said, in our opinion, the financial statements present fairly in all material respects the financial position of the chapter in conformity with the accounting principles generally accepted in the United States of America. <laughs> also, in our opinion, the chapter maintained in all material respects effective uh, control over financial reporting as of uh, the date of the audit. February 23rd, 2023. So that was my report and uh, be happy to entertain any questions that anybody might have. Uh, the report is available for your review and inspection if you so desire. Uh, it's very extensive, about a page and a half. <laughs> we appreciate the opportunity to uh, review the financial records and again, we think uh, our treasurer is doing a great job on our behalf. Any questions? Yes, sir. One. Uh, so I'm from the Plano chapter, and we had some trouble with the state getting reimbursement and fees, uh -huh. which we finally got, by the way. But this has been going on since 2019. Did you folks have a similar situation? Well, uh, you're, you're speaking to a former Texar treasurer for two years. Uh -oh. And uh, I can tell you that it is a cumbersome job, especially for a volunteer. Right. And I'm sure that uh, our treasurer is doing the best that he can to get the funds turned around in a timely fashion. And whether that's February or March or April or sometimes even in July, uh, money is forthcoming. And uh, it's uh, it's always been a problem. I think, I, I think I'm sorry. for the past two, like for the, while I was president for the past two years, and then uh, David Kinsey before, who's now the state treasurer, by the way, uh, I do not know that we ever had any real problems other than they never came as fast as we hoped they would. Time and this was always the issue. Uh, but uh, I know there was some issues back before that that I second or third hand heard about, but uh, well, that's kind of set up the process of using electronic funds transfer as the means to go ahead and send remittances to the various chapters. And as far as I know, there's only one or two chapters still outstanding that still have not stepped up to accepting EFT. Deposits. Why? I don't have a clue. No, I have to make sure we have that. So, uh, and then what he was reporting the $111, I'm sorry, that uh, uh, Peter Ford was reporting, we had, were, was, were assuming that was going to be there all, all of the basically the 2023 dues coming in. At least that's what Tom Milson had assumed. So I was a little bit shocked when it turned out to be. Much smaller amount than what I'd expected. But I've been told that either in basically in March, late March or April, we are going to get that payment. 
for the 2023 dues. It's for us, we're squared away up through September or something like that of last year. Yeah. Yeah. So, again, it doesn't come as quick. And uh, I mean, from, from our perspective, at least from Tom Hill's perspective, we have enough money to do right. basically everything we want. But I also know there's some small chapters that live pretty close to the edge. Right. And if that's always sort of a worry for the smaller chapters that, uh, that live close to the edge all the time and are trying to do more and more. Right. Uh, and so that, that's that's the part that bothers me about it. Anyway. Well, I would entertain a motion to accept the uh, results of the internal audit. I'm so willing to accept. Like we have a second. Okay. Feel hold it a second. Hey, yeah, hey, hold it. Yeah. Second. Feel second. Yeah. Any discussion? Hearing none. Um, all those in favor of the motion, say aye. 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 Any opposed, say nay. Motion's accepted. And thank you very much. Peter, thank you very much for all your help with that. Yep. You can sign. Again, I'll say uh, thank you to Peter McClellan and Laws. I know it's uh, a lot of work uh, doing that audit, being a volunteer. And, and also, Peter Ford, thank you for stepping up to the service treasurer. We really appreciate it. Okay, so do we have any other uh, any announcements from the floor? Anybody have anything else? Did you, uh, would you like yes, an update on the CIA? Yes, yes. Sure. Oh, yeah, that, sorry, great. Mm -hmm. We left you off there, sorry. Yeah. Um, let me find the notes. Oh. Thank you. I just wanted to uh, make a couple of comments. I attended a Zoom meeting on March the 9th uh, that was put on by uh, John Anderson of the Arlington chapter and Joe Sogan, who is the host chairman uh, for the Texar Society um, SAR. CAR committee. And basically, there was two uh, issues that were discussed. One was, you know, what is the state project that's being undertaken by the uh, state CAR society members? And they are focused on really uh, understanding the Buffalo Soldiers National Museum down in Houston and the role that the Buffalo Soldiers play uh, on our behalf. So they're focused in that direction. Uh, the other uh, piece of information was that uh, the CAR spring event is uh, they're gonna find a, a baseball game put on by the Houston Astros. And uh, they're gonna invite DAR, SAR, and CAR members to attend this event. So if any of you want to drive down and see the Houston Astros, that would be an opportunity to do that. So that's the latest information I have on the CAO. Hey, just one thing I thought. So I was passing this around here, and I'm going to get a moment if it doesn't fall apart. Oh, I did it again. It's easy. But anyway, so this is our notebook for uh, 2022. Uh, basically, it has all sorts of information about what you did. Over half of this notebook is because of Blog or Reedy. So we everybody give a hand if he does our minute. Thank you very much, Bob. And uh, we started doing several years ago minutes. We call them minutes with pictures, okay? And so, uh, like I said, we've got we've, we've done this. This will be the third year we've done it. We won third place at state. The first year, second place, the second year, and I'm shooting for first place this year. But I, Dallas is awfully hard to beat. So, <laughs> these end up over in uh, don't they? Yeah, I, I scanned versions of them. I actually kept the original, but I actually scanned versions, and they basically um, uh, uh, the University of North Texas. 
basically it was the archive facility that the Texas Society of Central American Revolution uses basically to store all the information. So, yep. And so, so keep your fingers crossed. We're trying to get first place, knock Dallas off. But again, you know, we've been doing this for 20, 20 years or so, and they've been down there for 93 years. So, you know, they got a little bit of a historic edge on us, but hope we will do that. After we get that done, like I said, I'm, I've already determined after this, I'm going to get a much better notebook to put this in. But hopefully we'll come home with the first place, which will be a nice little extra feather in our caps. And after that, I'll plan to start bring it to the meetings here for several months. So we sometime, you know, after you eat, if you would like to just look through it, there's some memories in there, lots of pictures of a lot of people in there uh, this year because of the losses that we had. We lost basically four members in this chapter of uh, this year. And so we had, we've got a little memorial section, each one of those four members we've lost. Um, and so, and then uh, some other interesting things going on. We're trying to get our, our color guard going right now. That's me, uh, that's uh, uh, Bob Milwee and uh, David Kinsey, but the, uh, David Kinsey, but David lives in East Texas now. So he didn't come to meetings anywhere. So we're always looking for color guard members. And for any of y'all that might like to shoot weapons or anything, you can get your black powder muskets. And we have actually, in the, in the right in downtown Denison, I guess, downtown Denison, Texas, we let a rip fired off these black powder muskets. No balls in them. I don't know why. We just put the powder in there. The kids love it. The smoke coming out of her. So, anyway, anyone interested? I'm looking at you. Okay. We would like to grow that and we can help you get the uniform and what you need. Okay. Okay. I'm through. Uh, when is the uh when the, when does this get submitted? Oh, I'll take it down to the the meeting here at the end of this month at Spring, Texas, and then it'll be judged on this that Saturday morning while we're down there. Okay. Wonderful. All right, anybody else have any, anything else? Okay, is, is Don Baz, are you still with us? Yeah, I was trying to unmute uh, my deal here. I'm here. Yes, sir. Uh, we are ready for the benediction. All right. Let's pray. Almighty God. We thank you for guiding this chapter of the Sons of the American Revolution tonight through the business and work of the chapter. And now we commit ourselves to your gracious mercy and protection as we journey to our homes and loved ones. Keep us in safety and use us in the service of our country. We ask this in the name of our Lord. Amen. Amen. Now we're ready for the uh, recessional. Until we meet again, let us bring our obligations to the forefathers who gave us our Constitution, the Bill of Rights, and the Supreme Court of the Nation of Free Men. All right, we are adjourned. Travel safely on. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, speak. Hey, Steve. Yes, sir. Thank <laughs> you.